Welcome back. We're showing you clips from David Suzuki's amazing meltdown in Australia this week. And by meltdown, I simply mean that he was asked questions by grown-ups, not the children he usually takes questions from. And those grown-ups were allowed to ask follow-up questions. And those grown-ups were often real scientists, not just TV scienticians like Suzuki. I have five more clips for you today, all on the same subject. It's an important subject. It's about feeding the world and making us all healthier. We've talked on the show before, for example, about golden rice. That's the genetically modified rice that adds vitamin A to rice that normally doesn't have it. Every year, literally hundreds of thousands of children in the third world die, not from hunger, but from lack of that vitamin A. So just by substituting this new golden rice with vitamin A for their usual white rice, that would literally save millions of lives, most of them children. It's true environmentalism when you think about it, important positive work with nature, and you'd think it would be up Suzuki's alley way back when he was a real scientist. That's actually what he studied, genetics. So let's start with a quick and weird comment from Suzuki about his own expertise, and then he goes deep into comments about GMO food. This goes back and forth for a while, but watch carefully. When I got my training in the Jurassic Age, got in my genetics in the 1950s and, and early 60s, we thought genes were beads on a string, right? And they were very stable. Now we know they jump all over the bloody place and they, they have all these effects. That we, when I was studying genetics, we didn't know anything about that. I'm just saying, what's the rush? The rush is being driven, I believe, by money not so much about uh, improving your culture. <laughs> Sorry, you, know, you did mention Africa, and Jim threw his hand up, so a quick, uh, uh, yes, quick yeah. comment there, Jim. Uh, I think the really important thing now, uh, our project is funded by the Gates Foundation. Yes, the plants will be given away for free. Um, no, they won't be forced on anybody. It'll, it'll be taken up, we believe, by the farmers, and particularly the female farmers, because they're concerned about their children. I believe very strongly, I believe very strongly that the big benefits of GM technology, and, and we're talking version four and five, not version one, which came out in 1996, right. but version four and five. When we're using plant genes, where we're developing uh, drought resistance, we're developing disease resistance, and the real benefit must come in Africa and Asia. And that's not where big companies are gonna make their money, because these are min primarily subsistence farmers. Well, that's great, and I think, the fact that you're saying these are step, what, four, five, or six, says why were we so anxious to rush in with step one in the first place? Well, it I was far so. too early. But I think it's like mobile phones. You remember back in 1996, the first mobile phone was mobile, but so is a grand piano. Well, if you I can don't lift think it. mobile. <laughs> You know, this was Suzuki's pattern for so many things. Remember, the first thing he did was accuse those who disagree with him of being motivated by money, the rush to market and profits. Now, when good faith critics, often other scientists or environmentalists, say they actually believe in humankind too, well, he's shamed into trying to make an attempt at a scientific rebuttal, but he, in this case, just doesn't have one. He just hasn't been following the science closely at all for years. He's not, he's a politician now, he's not a scientist anymore. He, he crumbles. The Australians invited top experts in. That guy there was working for the Gates Foundation. But they invited an even more precise scientist, a professor, a dean on the show, and they let him have at David Suzuki. Here's his question, and I'm going to play out Suzuki's long answer for a couple minutes. It's long, but I want you to see it. I want you to see how immediately Suzuki runs away from GMOs which you'd think he'd know something about, being a geneticist, he runs back to an old weird story about something else and he even gets that one wrong, but there's just so much here. But just watch it and I'll see you in a couple of minutes to talk about it. All right, our next question comes from the Dean of the Melbourne School of Land and Environment, Professor Rick Rausch. Hi, David. After 16 years of experience with genetically modified crops and now 10% of the world's cropland planted annually by more than 6 million farmers, Every major scientific organization in the world has agreed that the commercially available genetically modified crops are safe for food and the environment. The European Commission, for example, concluded that GM crops have been adopted rapidly by farmers globally because of reduced uh, production costs, reduced use of toxic pesticides, increases in yield, and net economic benefits to farmers. Herbicide-tolerant crops, for example, reduce tillage, erosion, and greenhouse gas emissions. 
So after all of this, what scientific evidence in particular supports your concerns about GM crops and food? Well, first of all, it's just based on, on experience that we simply don't know enough to anticipate the, uh, the consequences of very powerful technologies like this. Something much simpler called DDT, when we used it, I mean, Paul Mueller won a Nobel Prize for discovering DDT kills insects. But once it was used out in open fields, guess what? We discovered, oh my God, the open fields are very different from a controlled situation in a lab. And you end up affecting fish and birds and human beings. Unintended consequences. We didn't know about biomagnification. Now we're fooling around with the very stuff of, of life, the genetic information. And we are really caught up in the idea, while well, a gene is a gene, it's just a piece of DNA with a specific amount of information, and we can flip one that from, from here to here. Take a gene for, uh, 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 that will allow uh, a cod, a fish, or flounder to live below zero, it, it's got its own antifreeze, and stick that gene from the fish into a strawberry plant so it's, it's now frost-free. And you can do that manipulation. But that's kind of like taking Mick Jagger out of the Rolling Stones and sticking him in with the symphony, uh, the, the Sydney Symphony, and saying, now make music. Now you'll, you'll get noise coming out of it, but you can't really predict because it's the context within which each performer is going to uh, uh, produce a result. The context of a gene is the genome. And we simply don't know enough now to be able to anticipate all of the consequences of these big manipulations. If it's so safe, why is it that every time a, a geneticist discovers or does an experiment which seemed to show a negative effect, feeding genetically engineered potatoes to rats or whatever, they are pounced on by the genetics community and absolutely pounded, rather than saying, hey, wait a minute now, we better find out about this. I'm ashamed of my colleagues in genetics for the fact that they're not open any longer to the possibility of, uh, of harmful effects. I think it's far too early to say what the effects will be. I tell Canadians now, if we want to see the health effects of GMOs, just watch Canada over the next 10 years. We're already doing the experiment. We've been eating it now for over five years. Okay, we'll I, I, I'll... Oh, there's so much BS crammed in there. I just wanted you to see it. Now, normally this is where it would stop, right? Because there would never be a supplemental question asked again. He, he says GMOs are just five years old, so we should be scared. Yeah, try 15, 20, 25 years old. But, but that's just one fact. But the rest was a weird mishmash, wasn't it? An attempt to sound like a homespun wise man. But I think he came across as weak and childish in the presence of a true professor and expert. I mean, really, Mick... Jagger, that's your best scientific rebuttal to a fellow environmentalist professor? Seriously now? But the professor wasn't done. Normally he would be. Normally that would be the end of the debate. But the professor knew his stuff. And he actually knew David Suzuki's BS better than Suzuki did. Now, one of these two scientists was prepared for this debate. Here, listen to him. Well, David, let's take your example of DDT. So I got interested in entomology and genetics after reading Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. If you go back to Silent Spring, all of the key problems with DDT were really discovered by scientists by 1957, roughly seven to eight years after widespread use of DDT. And if you track what was happening in the entomologic community during that time, people, including some of my professors at Berkeley, were very concerned about DDT from its very introduction. Now let's contrast that to what's happening with GM crops. 16 years of use, extensive studies. European Union spent over 300 million euros looking for problems. And to paraphrase and, and turn around the comment you made to Stuart earlier, you're running counter to the vast majority of scientists on this one. If we were to look at the numbers of people that are, like James Dale that are working in this area, you'd find that it's about 97% of the people that work in this area are now convinced after 16 years of field use that this is pretty safe. And in terms of the great rush, as you may recall, the very first cases when people started having some success with genetic engineering, the first insect-resistant plants tested in the laboratory, were actually developed in 1986. It was 10 years before they got to the field. Now, it's, it's one of these cases of given the enormous environmental advantages, the reduction in pesticide exposure for farm workers, doing nothing can still do harm. At what point do we decide that these have enough of an advantage and have been so thoroughly examined by so many scientists, it's time to let them go? Well, look, Suzuki is still reciting false global warming talking points from the 1990s. 
<laughs> we, we showed you yesterday that he has no clue that global warming is measured by the IPC's own satellites. Just stopped in 1998. It, the world has not warmed since the 1990s. So Zuki is equally out of date with his GMO foods talking points. All of his knee-jerk anti-science prejudices and fears, really that's all they are, were thoroughly examined by real scientists and bureaucrats in the European Union. There is no scientific doubt anymore. Just political hucksters. So what did Suzuki have to say about all of that? Well, here's what he said. I would feel much more comfortable if I didn't see a history, you know, for people like Putsai and, and people who have really been hammered because of their negative results and basically suppression by their, by their colleagues because uh, it threatened the vested interests of the GMO companies and the GMO community. Well, I, I would dispute that because every one of these cases that people have, have moved forward and said, look, we've got a problem with this. If they haven't reached the published literature, such as the recent ones by Sarah Lini and so forth, they've certainly been shared widely on the internet. So I, I dispute no, that I, there's significant I, suppression. And actually, David, it's the people who have been the critics that have been ch challenged lately. I mean, Sarah Lini pr prosecuted a case against French scientists for libel on the grant because the French scientists dared to challenge Sarah Lini. So it's cutting both ways. Mm -hmm. So again, Suzuki reached for his typical political attack. He implied that the big corporations were trying to silence the critics of GMO food. But the real scientists in the room there proved that it's the anti-GMO activist, the guy named Seralini, who was the one suing his critics to shut them up. The anti-GMO guy was throwing the slap suits around. And it's tough enough to accuse the Bill Gates Foundation, which is giving away GMO food to the world's poor, Tough to accuse them of being motivated by profit. Suzuki was losing this chess game piece by piece, wasn't he? And it's no surprise. Look, he only has a few chess moves that he keeps using time and again. Accuse the other person of being motivated by money. Accuse, you know, use junk science statistics. Make things up if needed, like he did yesterday on the show about cyclones, knowing you'll never be fact-checked. Question the other guy's motives. Tell a meandering story using allegories and funny anecdotes about Mick Jagger. He's only got one set of moves. And these guys knew his moves in advance, and they demolished him on his supposed area of expertise, genetics. And he couldn't run away there. I mean, what was left? Everything he threw up to distract or defend on the GMO issue was calmly swatted down by experts. The cameras were still rolling. Uh-oh. What would he say about GMO foods now? The cameras were still on. Can I, can I get you to respond to that, but also yeah. this. Uh, what if that is the thing which will help us feed the coming 9 billion people on the planet? Well, I mean, uh, that is always the ar argument that's made. GMOs are very, very expensive. Now, the people that, that need this, this food are not going to be able to afford it. Are we going to just create these new crops and then give them away? I simply don't believe that's what's going to happen. I don't think it's a generosity for the rest of humanity that uh, is driving actually, this activity. Actually, we are. I mean, BT corn technology has been given away to the Kenyan state government research people for use for subsistence farmers. Monsanto gave away insect-resistant potatoes in Mexico over 20 years ago. J James is working on lots of similar cases. In cases where there's no um, economic return, it is, in fact, being given away, and they're not so difficult to develop. When I was at Cornell, we got a gene that was a gift from Monsanto for experimental purposes. We made broccoli plants that were resistant to the attacks of dimeback moths. A student, one of our students, made 50 transformants in about 60, six months. The great cost of these things are no longer the actual creation of the plant. It's the regulatory challenges to make sure that you can take them to market to do all that safety testing. Okay, Rick, well, we get a response to that and we'll move on. Well, I don't have any response. It sounds great. I don't know. <laughs> you might change your mind on this subject. Then. Well, I, I am certainly Given open. Given the scientific consensus. I am certainly open to be, to be convinced. Mm -hmm. I am, I'm not saying there isn't a future... In, in this, I believe that there, this is a very powerful technology and that it's got immense potential. The problem is that it is so powerful, I don't think we should be rushed into it. If the Africans don't want GMOs, let the Africans say, keep it out. Don't force it into them by giving them GMOs as some kind of gift and say, okay. What an idiot. Five rounds they went on GMO foods, five rounds. It took five attacks to get through all of Suzuki's BS. I call them attacks. 
the real world's argument. See, Suzuki is only used to going one round in a debate, as in he makes a speech and gets paid a fat check, and everyone else's job is to listen and clap. Uh, maybe he'll rarely do a second round, like letting children asking him uh, a softball question that's being pre-screened, but five rounds like that with real experts who actually read scientific journals, who actually know their material. It took a round or two to get through Suzuki's bumper sticker deep homilies, his little anecdotes that are good enough to get him through cocktail party chatter. But after five rounds, he had nothing left. And when he was pressed to submit to real scientists, well, he gave them a grudging, yeah, maybe you got me. It was the worst interview of David Suzuki's life. In other words, it was the best interview in the interest of truth and real science. I don't think Suzuki will actually change his mind on GMOs. He's not a scientist anymore, really. He's an entertainer. He's a multi-millionaire celebrity speech giver. He sells himself by preaching panic and worry. No one's going to listen to him tell good news stories about GMO food or natural gas fracking. Those are good news stories. And his big ticket funders, especially his highly, highly ideological foreign foundation funders, they just won't cut checks anymore to his David Suzuki Foundation if he suddenly starts supporting the technology and science of progress instead of opposing progress. And that's the ugly truth about Suzuki. He's not a scientist, really. He knows very little about things, even things that a well-read non-scientist should know. He's actually anti-science. He's all based on emotion and personal attacks and going after scientists who disagree with him based on accusations of them being paid off. When faced with facts that disagree with his theories, he usually throws out the facts and keeps his biases. He is a national embarrassment, and we needed Australia's Broadcasting Corporation to show us that. <laughs> That's a national embarrassment, too, that our own Canadian media party was too terrified to take on St. Suzuki. Well, at the sun, we're not. Tune in tomorrow for our third and final edition of Suzuki's weird comments from Australia. I call that tomorrow Suzuki's deep thoughts, a snapshot into the bizarre mind of this unscientific man.